welcome everybody um, to this volunteer to career conference. Really delighted to have so many people joining us and to hear about the uh, to hear about the program. And great to see some uh, old friends and also some new faces um, joining us today. Um, my name is Mark Lever. I'm Chief Executive Help Force, and I'll be uh, I'll be chaperoning you through the uh, through the day. We've got some fabulous fabulous speakers, and we've got plenty of time at the end for for questions and answers. So, if you do have any questions and answers as we go through um, the presentations, please just pop them into the chat chat box, and one of the team will collate those and put the questions to the panel at the end of the session. We're not going to have the opportunity to use the hands up function because there are just so many people here, um, as I'm sure you appreciate. Can you just make sure that you're all muted, please? Obviously, those of you who are going to speak, I want you to unmute yourselves because we want to hear what you've got to say. But the rest of you, if you could just mute yourselves, that would be really helpful. And we're really keen to encourage people to tweet as much as possible about the event. Um, obviously, don't get too distracted so you're not listening to our great speakers. But if you do tweet about the event, can you just use the hashtag volunteer to career, please? That would be really um, that would be really helpful. We're going to uh, record the conference so we can share that with uh, a much wider audience um, and it's already started recording. So hopefully everybody's um, everybody's comfortable. Everybody's comfortable with that. Um, we were hoping to have um, an introduction from uh, Ruth May, but unfortunately she's not well, but she has sent she has sent an introduction for me to read out to you. So I'll put on my best. Um, Tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be Ruth May voice and uh, and read out her welcome to you. But before we start, we just want to do a very quick poll, which is a very simple poll. And that is, would you consider volunteer to career as part of your workforce strategy solution? So we're just interested to know right at the start if if you would consider volunteer to career as part of your workforce solution. And then we'll ask the question at the end and see if we've had uh, if we've had any impact. So the poll's coming up now. So all you've got to do is just click yes or no. So have have you considered volunteering as part of your workforce strategy? So before now, have you considered volunteering as part of your um, workforce strategy? That's the that's the question, and it's a yes or no. And while you're uh, contemplating those two those two options, I'll just read out the um, introduction that we had from uh, that we had from Ruth May, who sends her apologies. And Ruth says, I'm sorry not to be able to join you today because I'm passionate about the value that volunteering can bring to individuals in considering their future career choices. Um, and I know how passionate Ruth is about volunteering because I was part of the NHS volunteering task force, which she chaired. Um, and she was incredibly engaged with the whole volunteer to career program. And, and she's demonstrated that many times. She's grateful to Help Force for, for facilitating this event and for contributing to Health Education England's work to strengthen the pathways from volunteering into the into the workforce. Um, she hopes that we'll all go away from today's event, having shared ideas and inspiration, which will help us all to maximise the amazing potential of volunteering within, within the NHS. And I know that um, having seen the speakers, I know that you will be inspired because we've got some really fabulous, um, really fabulous speakers with us uh, with us today. And I'll introduce those as we go through the um, as we go through the session. I do want to particularly mention two organisations and groups without whom this programme would never have started. And the, the first one is at the risk of embarrassing her is uh, Debbie McEwen from South Tees, who when we first started looking at volunteer to career, she was providing an inspirational level of support to volunteers and has seen hundreds of her volunteers go into employment. And, and it's it's not overstating to say that Debbie was a big part of the inspiration behind this uh, behind this program. Um, and the second organisation I'd like to thank is uh, the Bedette Trust for Nursing, because without their funding, we wouldn't have been able to do the work we do. We're only able to support the programme because we get funding from um, the debt, which is a wonderful, uh, wonderful charitable trust that funds us. Um, and then latterly, um, the support that we get from um, Health Education England to continue to support the programme is really second to none. So without having the funding from um, the, the, those funders, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do. And frankly, it's seeing such a tremendous um, growth in the programme. When we started, 
um, our first cohort, we had five, five trusts in the programme. Um, due to the level of interest and support that people want with the programme, by March next year, we'll have 33 trusts in the programme, a uh, just phenomenal growth um, in those. And we'll hear, hear from one of those um, later on this morning to hear their story and how they've um, and how they've worked with um, worked with the programme and and what they think their um, the, the benefits are from the programme that they've um, they've been working on with us. So we really appreciate that. We really appreciate that support. Um, before I sort of dive into the volunteer to career programme, I know that there'll be a lot of you on here who probably won't know much about Helpforce, and I just thought I would say a little bit about us. Um, we're a charity that was set up nearly six years ago, um, initially to work with um, the NHS to help them promote volunteering, grow their volunteering roles, and importantly, increase the impact of their volunteering roles. So supporting NHS Trust to design volunteer roles that would have a significant impact on the health and well-being of patients, staff and the volunteers themselves. Post COVID, our work has stretched beyond the boundaries of um, the NHS Trust, and we're now working across um, whole systems. Um, and to do to give us a framework um, for our volunteering development activity, we've um, we've mapped out our Help Force Back to Health pathway, which essentially identifies the four areas where we think volunteers can make the greatest impact for patients and staff um, for their health and well-being. So it starts with looking at ways in which we can engage and support community organisations to work alongside NHS Trust to support people while they're waiting. Um, it looks at volunteering opportunities to help people get well quicker in hospital. Um, it looks at ways in which we can work with community organisations and NHS Trust to help people recover well when they get home. So help them to get home quicker and recover well when they get home. And then ultimately to look at ways in which they can live well, um, working alongside public health agencies, um, social prescribers, link workers to support people to, to, you know, to get better quicker. And what we found is with this back to health pathway, it gives us a great framework for working with, as I say, NHS trusts and other health and care organisations to explore how we can design volunteering roles to improve people's health and well-being and increase the impact of volunteering as we go along. And one of the trends that you'll see as we as we speak is this great focus on impact and measurement of impact. We know that without the measurement of impact, we can't get the attention of senior leaders, we can't make services sustainable, and we can't develop cases for investment, business cases for investment to support volunteering in the long term. So the measurement of impact is incredibly important to us as we, as we go forward. And I want to start by sharing with you the emerging insights we've got from that first cohort of volunteer to career partners, volunteer to career trust that we've been working with and really the impacts that have motivated funders to put more funding into this programme and have motivated more NHS trusts to take part in the programme as well. So early insights from, the, um, from our programme. Nearly 90% of the volunteers who've taken part in the programme to date have either secured employment in health and care or have moved on to further education and training in health and care. That is a phenomenal conversion rate. I mean, our feeling is that that way exceeds our expectations of a conversion of volunteers who volunteered within health and care settings and are now embarking on a career in health and care as a result of their as a result of their volunteering going forward. But then there, if you look behind some of those um, statistics and look at the other emerging in, insights, we've seen really high levels of sustained interest in um, in volunteering. Um, we've seen sustained levels of interest and confidence in a career in volunteering. We've seen really high proportion of the people involved applying for jobs in um, in health and care settings. And we've seen a really high proportion of people going on to take um, higher and further education in, in health and care. So really um, convincing stats. As I say, these are our emerging insights from the first cohorts that have gone through the programme. What excites us about having 33 trusts involved in the programme by the end of March 
is the scale of data that we'll see coming on board then and being able to have some really significant sample sizes and some really significant learning from the programme to um, encourage others um, to get involved and see, see Volunteer to Career not as a volunteering programme, but as a career development programme and see it as a strand that supports um, the workforce challenges in health and care. We're not saying it's the solution to all the workforce challenges, that would be naive, but we do see it as being a strand to support the workforce challenges that we have there. And the bottom, the bottom uh, section of uh, data there that we're, we're looking at on the screen now highlights some of those systemic changes that we've seen as a result of the Volunteer to Career programme. So Volunteer to Career programmes have been running in trust where there were already volunteering schemes, but not necessarily schemes which were focused on taking people on a, on a career journey. And we've seen uplifts in a number of other areas of improvement on volunteering in those areas as a result of the Volunteer to Career programme. So 17% improvement in the view of volunteering services, um, a much greater proportion, 29% staff who felt that volunteers are improving their working lives. So these are improvements from the beginning of the programme to the end of the programme. 58%, uh, sorry, 58 minutes of staff time being saved per volunteer working alongside them and a much greater um, interest in the, the proportion of staff who are supporting volunteers and who feel volunteers are enabling them to deliver good care. These are really impressive stats and albeit there are emerging insights from those first cohorts, but we think if these are multiplied up as we take on the uh, the 33 trusts going forward, we could have a really convincing argument for volunteer to career to go stratospheric within the NHS. Um, just a word about the early stages of volunteer to career. Um, as I say, Help Force um, worked with NHS trusts and we worked alongside NHS trusts to deliver intelligently designed volunteering roles designed to improve the experience of staff, patients and the system as a result of volunteering. And as you see there, um, there are some really impressive stats on improvements, um, whether it's volunteers who are supporting people with hydration and nutrition, whether it's volunteers who are improving the health and well-being of staff, whether it's helping to reduce the length of stay, whether it's the experience of patients as a result of um, being supported by volunteers whilst they were in hospital. So we had really brilliant um, data showing the impact of volunteers in the general volunteering programmes within NH in NHS Trust. And what we noticed there was a number, you know, there were a number of volunteers who were starting to express an interest in careers in volunteering. And our early surveys of volunteers told us that that really high proportion of volunteers interested in a career in health and care, but actually they weren't able to tell anyone about it and nobody was asking them about it. So you had this pool of volunteers who were interested in volunteering, but nobody was, there was nobody there to talk to about it and they didn't know who to talk to about it and nobody asked them about it. And then clinicians that we spoke to were really interested in supporting the volunteering agenda and they could see the value of the volunteering agenda, but they didn't have plans in place. And when we explored that with them, it was because they felt they needed more support. They didn't really know what to do. They were lack of busy, you know, they, they were busy and they had lack of uh, lack of time in their team, lack of capacity. Interestingly, nobody cited budget as a factor. So these early insights really were the, the insights that helped drive us to think about how we structure a programme of support to develop a more structured approach to um, volunteer to career. And we decided to build our volunteer to career programme on three particular strategic platforms. The first one was, and I'm hoping it's going to come up now, but it doesn't seem to be, v. I'm not sure why that, uh, why that slide's not coming up if for you me. Click, just get, click one more click. Just one more click. I've given it one more click. I don't know, um, don't know Sam, if you can get that. Ah, there brilliant. And then one more See, click. Sam is much better at clicking than me. If, if you can click it, Sam, as I as I talk through it, that would be great. The, the first aim of the programme was to make sure that we positively impact workforce recruitment needs um, at that local community level. And, and we were really keen to make sure that the recruitment of volunteers reflected the diversity of the local communities where the programmes were being run, because we saw that as being an important way of filtering through the workforce um, a more diverse range of uh, potential recruits. The second, um, the second aim of the programme 
was to look at how we could deliver systemic change throughout the organisations who are participating. So that was making sure that clinical leadership were brought into the programme, that the environment and culture of the organisation was supporting and valued volunteers as part of the uh, 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 as part of the support for the workforce, and that the volunteer to career pathways were designed to attract and retain volunteers that were meeting local needs. And then finally, the third one was to enable us to capture the evidence and the best practice and scale and spread that through the use of case studies and scale and spread that at a local level so that the um, so that the programme grew. I'm now going to take control of these slides back from Sam because I've got a very fancy button which will enable me to do that and then show you the three phases of the programme that we developed to support that. So there's, you know, when you embark on the volunteer to career programme, three very distinct stages, the development stage, the delivery stage and the sustainability stage. At the start of the programme, it starts with our volunteer to career self-assessment tool, which is an online tool that allows you to answer a whole load of questions, which enables you to benchmark your current volunteering practices within your trust and produces your report which helps you identify where you've got strengths and where you've got areas that need development. We've the second part of the development phase is a whole series of online training and development modules that will enable your clinical leaders who are involved in the programme to develop the skills to implement a volunteer to career programme. And there's, it covers a whole range of skills from project management to strategic development to business planning. And then the third element of support in the development phase is the support of a helpful mentor to the clinical to the clinical lead who's been identified alongside a tutor that works on delivering the uh, training and development programs for us. In the delivery phase, the clinical leadership role and the funding for the program allows us to provide funding to support one of your clinical leaders to take on that role within the program. The clinical leadership role is critical and they embark on a four week training program which implements all of the various training modules I discussed, but it basically equips them with the skills to develop the program to meet the specific recruitment needs that you have in your trust. Our impact and insight team work alongside your clinical lead to ensure that an evaluation framework is put in place so that we can capture the data about the program and we can demonstrate the impact of that program as it moves along. And throughout the whole program, We've got support from your help, help force program manager who will provide you with that support should you need mentoring, should you need any additional training. And we also facilitate facilitate group discussions with other members of the uh, volunteer to career program. And then the final stage is sustainability, which is really important to us, which is the way in which we make sure that there's systemic change within your trust as a result of this. So volunteer to career is embedded within your workforce plans. We make sure that there's a business, we support you to develop a business case for future investment, and we support you to scale and spread the programme locally. So three distinct phases in the programme to, to support you. From the volunteers point of view, the experience is really well supported so that um, the volunteers have a, a well-structured induction and a resource pack to support them through the process. They work alongside the clinical lead to understand what their career aspirations might be, and they can choose the particular volunteering roles that would appeal to them. And then they're mentored and supported by the clinical lead throughout the programme. Towards the end of the programme, they then get support from employability providers, and then they will hopefully go on secure employment or education and training in the, in the programme and go forward. The types of roles that we've seen people taking on are many and varied. Um, all in uh, lots of clinical settings, eye clinics, um, support for patients and staff. There are community based um, volunteers, volunteers in baby clinics, specialist play support, peer debrief um, in mental health settings, wellbeing volunteers. So there's a whole range um, of volunteer roles that really make a difference and give people the opportunity to move into um, move into a career within, you know, within that setting. So we've now got an opportunity to hear about how it works in practice. Um, and our next speaker is going to be Bob Champion. And um, Bob is the Chief People Officer at Bradford and District um, Community Trust. And he's going to tell his story of how he's worked with the Volunteer to Career Programme um, and how it's been integrated into the, uh, into the workforce strategy. 
So I'm now going to hand over to um, I'm going to hand over to Bob and mute and let Bob tell you his story. Welcome, Bob. Thank you very much, Mark. I take it I'm live. Um, there were there was a slide, but I, I've got uh, written down in front of me what I was going to talk to. I think the question why Bradford District Care Trust uh, wants to integrate volunteering into career into its workforce strategy is why not? It, it would be daft not to. Um, and unfortunately, I've had experience of volunteering to career opportunities prior to this this program becoming invented in, in that um, uh, my story goes in that uh, in a previous life I had an encounter with uh, Tracy from Dagenham who was a CAM service user uh, and was uh, frequently vocal about the quality of the care that she received and uh, the, the way in which the organisation uh, that we, we worked within uh, um, supported people who had views and opinions and, and so it was no surprise to get Tracy engaged in uh, patient involvement service user involvement work as a volunteer to help um, advise particularly on our, our on our recruitment methodologies. Um, Tracy did so well in this that we we appointed her a coach and a mentor and uh, eventually started talking about what she'd like to do after uh, a, a life of worklessness uh, and coming from a, a workless family and within a year we had supported Tracy to embark upon an apprentice scheme to uh, do business and administration and within six months of, of starting off with that apprentice scheme Tracy was able to gain full-time employment within the organisation as a patient experience facilitator. So that's just a, a kind of a, a brief summary of, of what could happen without putting any structure or, or, or kind of huge organisation around the programme. So I just wanted to talk about what the impact of this programme so far has been on Bradford District Air Trust. Uh, uh, nowhere near as, as, as impactful as it has been in South Tees and I think that uh, that record stands for itself in, in that uh, uh, it's uh, it's done very, very well. Um, volunteering to career is very much in its infancy in Bradford. And um, so far, we've, we've actually converted five volunteers in, into full time employment um, across a diverse range of, of roles, uh, equally as diverse as the range of volunteering opportunities that, that one sees. So specifically in, in Bradford, we've, we've helped people move from volunteering into uh, training as a dietitian. Uh, one's gone on to work in the housing sector uh, within uh, adult social care. Uh, there's some work gained in, in GP practice world, uh, as well as in the volunteering sector. And we're also supporting another individual to go forward into a career in nursing. I suppose next uh, in line would be how we consider our volunteers to be an untapped resource for, for recruitment. and. Um, if you look at the reasons for volunteering, uh, particularly around help with recovery, help with therapeutic uh, interventions, and even the try before you buy uh, principle, there are a number of opportunities for people within the scope of volunteering to look at opportunities to work within, within health and social care. And um, they're effectively a captive audience. So want to be nurtured and supported. Uh, and also a cost effective workforce solution if you think that having people available to be considered for work experience uh, you have the captive audience you have a reduction in potential advertising and recruitment costs uh, a reduction in onboarding and pre-employment screening costs and a, a huge reduction in the onboarding time expertise and, and costs because they will have a greater understanding of the organisation from, from either being a service user or, or volunteering within. And that in, in turn helps with the sustainability. If we use our volunteer workforce within the local population from our local com communities, we can have that, uh, that supply chain if effectively uh, and um, it helps to pe people to uh, consider employment opportunities directly from school or other education or later on in their lives. 
Um, I think from, from our experience as an organisation, as I say, it is relatively um, embryonic. Um, we've been doing it for a year. We've got another cohort of um, people embarking upon the scheme now, and, and we hope to have the same similar type of success with them uh, as we have done with our with our first group. And we'll be looking to expand it uh, in, in a way that creates a sustainable supply chain of, of people into careers within not only our organisation, but the wider um, healthcare system and uh, including opportunities in, in the wider social care agenda. I think our relatively modest success has been down to application and a will to progress with this with this initiative uh, thanks to Holly Catherine who's on screen here and, and her team as well as the invaluable support and help from Help Force who have uh, enabled us to put some structure uh, and science behind our activities and to uh, enable us to have a, a sustainable way of, of moving this program into business as usual. Uh, I think that's probably all I'd want to say on the subject. Uh, I will be supporting the Q&A sessions afterwards um, later on in the uh, in the session. Great stuff. Thank, thank you very much, Bob. Um, the lesson there is never ignore Tracy from Dagenham um you know and and the opportunities that that, that present themselves bob, bob mentioned catherine um who's um a great partner for uh, for help force and she'll be joining us on the uh, on the q a session as well so it, it it's great to have the uh, the bradford team the bradford team here i i think one of the things that um really struck me um about bob's sort of reflections was that there is a much broader opportunity to um, look at the impact on HR costs as well. Um, so there's clearly an untapped um, resource for the for the workforce from volunteers. But actually, once you've got well trained volunteers who are supported, that migration from volunteering into the workforce can, you know, can be really cost effective and can save time on recruitment as well. So I think there was a really good, uh, really good points there. So thanks, Bob. And look forward to um, hearing questions that people have raised on your uh, on your presentation. Our next speaker is uh, Kirsty Marsh Hyde, who is the National Programme Manager for Apprenticeships at Health Education England. And she's going to talk to us about why Health Education England is so keen to uh, financially support the Volunteer to Career programme, but how it fits in with their own strategy as well. So over to you, Kirsty. Good morning and thanks, Mark. Um, lovely to be here this morning with everyone. Lovely to have this opportunity to talk about this. Um, I've got a, a couple of slides and then um, I'll be around a little bit later as well. So I just wanted to give, as Mark said, a bit of context to why Health Education England supports the Volunteer to Career programme. Um, so if we have the next slide, please, that would be lovely. Thank you very much. So um, Volunteer to Career really supports um, Health Education England's overall goals in the workforce space across England and supporting employers in um, many different ways um, through the agenda that my particular director works on. So I'm lucky enough to work in a director at HE called Talent for Care. And Talent for Care, for anyone who hasn't um, been familiar with it previously, is uh, the part of HEE that looks at kind of getting into, getting ready for, getting on in and going further throughout the workforce. Um, traditionally, we specifically supported um, support roles, um, for instance, healthcare support workers, um, and that's really branched out across uh, lots of different roles in the 10 years that we've existed. Um, and we have three main strands. So um, I personally work in apprenticeships, but I work very, very closely with my colleagues in volunteering. And we have a widening access and participation uh, pillar as well. And the National Volunteering Unit, um, where my colleagues work and I work very closely with them, is designed to support volunteering across health and social care. So um, that's in various different ways through the design development and promotion of education, training and development of resources and opportunities 
for the whole sector. Um, and this entire programme is aligned to the NHS long term plan, to the people plan and to the Department of Health and Social Care's mandate to health education England. So you can see how um, volunteer to career sits really, really nicely within our overarching aims anyway. Um, the, the volunteering unit is there to, to further support the training, learning and development um, of this area of work and to support staff and volunteers. Um, and as been has been touched on already in very recent times has been critical as part of our sector response to COVID. Um, so this is really where in a kind of structural way this this programme sits and we're very glad to have it. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So again, this has been touched on already and we've been given some really great examples of tangible ways that this is been made real in Bradford and in other places and I'm sure we'll hear more as well um, but as an overarching national strand of strategy volunteering is a great way to build an engaged community um, and that community can be you know there's different interpretations of that community that can be the community of a trust or it can be of a team or it can be of a system um, you know, with a with a line in and out of the employment sector. Um, it's a great way for people to get in to NHS careers. We know that there are still challenges in terms of making sure that people out there know what the opportunities are, um, what, you know, the 350 careers can look like within the NHS. Volunteering is a really good way of showcasing some of that and making it real to local people who are interested um, and of course, the employer having access to those people as well and being able to have them in the fold. Um, it can be especially helpful for individuals who may not be able to access careers via other routes. So, as I mentioned before, we have many pillars to the work that we do and um, the golden thread throughout that is engaging marginalised groups and underrepresented groups and trying to remove as many barriers as we can. And as you can imagine, volunteering is a really great way that people who, for various myriad reasons, wouldn't come into employment in exactly the same way or haven't done previously, can uh, go through that door and um, experience something. Some of the recruitment processes are slightly different there, um, can seem slightly less off-putting than other ways in. And uh, obviously this varies from, from setting to setting, but there's a lot of ways that this can help people who are finding it harder to get into the workforce via other routes. Um, and it can be a stepping stone for young people who wish to explore careers in health and social care. Um, again, you know, that first step on the ladder, looking at ways in, um, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk a lot today about how volunteering is not just for young people. And, you know, we wouldn't want to badge any group in any particular way, but it can be really, really helpful. Um, with that group, particularly with a specific focus. Next slide, please. So this is um, just a little bit about the how and, and what practically has happened under HEE's banner in recent times. So um, to date, we have 21 pilot NHS organisations participating in the review of the accredited National Volunteering Certificate. Um, and the certificate um, consists of 60 hours of volunteering in a job um, in a role plus e-learning training. Um, 5,000 NHS ambassadors have also volunteered their time to speak in schools, promoting NHS careers. So that's another aspect of uh, kind of volunteering that we support in terms of that wider piece of getting the world to know about what is available and what opportunities can be there locally. Um, and in partnership with Help Force, we're currently funding 13 trusts to create an innovative volunteer to career roles um, and has been touched on already, you know, very much embedded in local workforce recruitment needs mapped to um, exactly what needs to happen in that setting. Um, you know, a flexible process that, as Mark has touched on and others have touched on, uh, works for that local employer. Um, this last point is just um, to tell you that we're continuing to grow that. So. Um, there's been great demand and interest in this programme, which is wonderful. And there's now an opportunity for, for us to fund a further 10 NHS organisations to bid to join this programme. 
So if you are not already part of the programme and you would like to be or you'd like to be in the future, um, you can get further details by um, emailing the email address on this slide. Um, it's not a live opportunity yet. So um, this is to kind of register your interest. And, and when we are able to share details, we will do um, through that method. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour around um, Health Education England supporting this programme. But we're very, very glad to be here. Very glad to be part of this programme and, um, and hope that it goes from strength to strength. Thanks very much. Great stuff. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kirsty, and, and thanks for all the support that Health Education England give to the to the programme. As I say, without it, we wouldn't be able to expand it going going forward. So we really do appreciate it. And I think it's I think what you were saying is really helpful because it it gives it a context within the national um, NHS, linking it to the long term plan and other sort of talent for care initiatives that are going on and emphasises that this isn't just a, a standalone programme. This is actually a, a programme that is integrated into the longer term thinking of, of, of the NHS, which I think is important, but then is actually translated at a local level into local recruitment needs and the need to recruit a diverse workforce from the communities where those health and care organisations and NHS trusts are actually based. So I think it's really important that there's that link between the national strategy and also local local recruitment needs, which I think is really important. So um, thanks so much for that. And um, as I say, thank you for the ongoing support of the of the programme. We've, we've now got the main event. Um, we, we, we've been talking about volunteers to career, but it would be great to hear the story of uh, one person who's who's walked this journey. Um, and we're really thrilled to have Rosie Sullivan here um, to talk to us. And we really appreciate her, her doing this. Um, I, I've said to Rosie, she doesn't need to look at all the faces on here. She just needs to think. Imagine she's just talking to her, her favourite person and ignore all these uh, all these faces on the screen. Um, but Rosie was a volunteer on the Volunteers Career Programme at um, Camden and Islington NHS uh, Foundation and Trust, supported by the uh, the wonderful Joe Scott. Again, he's a great partner of Help Force. We've done some great work together. Um, but we all thought that it would be brilliant for all of you to hear the story. One example of a volunteer who's been on the programme and has moved into a career and uh, hear Rosie's fabulous story. So Rosie, I'm going to hand over to you. You can unmute yourself and you can talk to us all about your brilliant story. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Help Force, for having me. Um, and Joe. I feel very nervous. This is my first ever. Oh, I can see Joe in front of me now. I feel a lot better. Um, I feel quite nervous, but yeah, so a bit about me. This is, I have actually, I've got a script, but I'm just going to go from the heart because this is some a program that I'm just so passionate about. And it's open doors that I never, ever thought I would end up achieving. And it's just incredible. So a little bit about me. Um, I've got my own lived experience of mental health, which is what led me to Camden Islington. And at the beginning, I was just about to give up on volunteering for the moment because I didn't find anything that was just right for me. And then I came across um, Camden and Islington and I started as a shop trolley volunteer. And I can't believe that a year later, I'm now a paid peer coach as part of a pilot scheme for the NHS. Rosie, could I just ask you just to hang on a bit? I think you were and um, you were muted. If you could just repeat oh. again, your bit of oh your story. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. It was so good. So sorry. Oh no. We were okay. there when you said you were you got a paid job, and we were yeah. so immersed in that. I'm so sorry, but yeah. So I have my lived experience. I started at Can Candy as a shop trolley, ended up becoming a peer coach, and um. And yeah, so this opportunity, I wouldn't have done it without uh, Help Forces program and jo, Jo's, Joanne Scott's help. So um, yeah, I found myself doing this and what I've learned from it, I've been able to take uh, so many opportunities. I've been able to start doing befriending, restraint debrief, um, the shop trolley and all these things. I've learned so many transferable skills that were for that just completely fed into my new job as a peer coach and also something that I'm so passionate about is helping people's experiences um, and 
and yeah just improving people's times while in hospital because I've been there too and I know how it feels to be so lost in mental health and this is exactly why I'm doing this so I found um, Camden Islington which is a trust that champions its volunteers we get to see feedback and that builds your confidence knowing how valuable you are and what a difference you make to the hospital and Joanne has been incredible I've received one-to-one -one support all throughout it's been career focused in the sense that we have regular catch-ups Jo sends me jobs that she thinks might be really good and even some jobs I think to myself I can't believe that she thinks that I could do this but it just again shows that Jo really believes in me and believes that I can do this and you know completing surveys on a monthly basis just to say what route I'd like to go down if I'm still interested in careers which of course I've thrown myself at all different opportunities in the trust and that's why I've learned these skills and finally you know been so lucky to get a job in the trust that I already feel like I'm part of the family which is another um strength of the career to the volunteer to career is feeling applying within a trust where you have people in your corner that believe in you which you know I got to do all different courses like interview courses different training and I just feel like that really put, gave me an edge because I believed in myself and I already felt like I was part of this trust and it's a place that I am so passionate about and I feel like now it's just completely open doors so for me I'm part of this pilot and Rosie, you're on mute again. I'm so sorry. Can you just oh, I didn't press that. I don't know how that just no, happened. No just a we just missed a little bit, but we're good now. I feel like I'm really thrown off now, if I'm honest. <laughs> I don't know why that happened. My mouth is nowhere near that. Um, you, you're doing great, Rosie. Doing you're doing great. great. Oh, gosh. This is, okay, so, yeah. So, to summarise, I've got my timer on as well. But I've had, you know, just incredible hospital-based experience. I've got to work with doctors, nurses, staff, service users, incredible volunteers. And I think for me as well, to go in and do a restraint debrief, which I'm speaking with another volunteer, one-on-one -on -one with a service user, and then we get to go up to a doctor, to a nurse, and that's not daunting. And that just goes to show how much this program instills that confidence that, you know, I believe in what I'm doing is really making a good cause, really for a good cause. Um, and yeah, just, um, I, I wholeheartedly believe that any organisation which is interested in this, go for it, take advantage of the opportunity because you've got some incredible, passionate volunteers, especially if it's anyone like me, I like to do as many opportunities as I can and it's evidently really worked out because now I'm starting this incredible um, pilot which is, you know, I could never imagined and that's all thanks to Joanne and everybody at Help Force. And also Help Force, just thank you for believing in me and having me as part of this incredible um, this incredible programme. Um, I've just gained so much, not only personal growth, not only career growth, but uni growth. I'm able to go into hospital and it's like learning interactively, which, you know, all of these things, just thank you. And yeah, I just hope to keep growing and I'm so grateful to have been part of this. So I hope that's OK. <laughs> Rosie, that, that was fantastic. I'll tell Sorry you what... <laughs> Don't don't you worry about that. I'll tell you what. If if the career in health and care doesn't work out, you've got a career in the media. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> absolutely fantastic. Um, I I defy anybody not to have had a smile on their face while you were talking. I mean, oh, it was just so you. inspiring. You did such a fantastic job, and and uh, and big big thumbs up, big round of applause for Joe Scott as well. Um, yeah, because you know. Great volunteers have great support, great leaders, and 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 Joe is certainly a, a a great supporter. I know she's a great supporter of you, but a great leader of volunteering there. So, Rosie, fantastic! Thanks so much for Thank doing you. that. And you did you if anybody nobody would have thought you were nervous. Nobody thought you were anxious about that. You came across brilliantly. So thank Good. you. Thank you very much, everyone. No, thank you, thank you. Um, wow, God, I feel sorry for the person who's got to follow that, Maeve. Um, <laughs> but uh, just j j just uh, while Maeve's preparing herself, um, I, I was going to say if you if any of you are interested in talking to us about the program, if anything you've heard has sparked an interest in the program, do put your details in the in the chat box. If you, I've seen lots of questions going in the chat box, and um, we'll have a Q and A session uh, Q and A session shortly. But do, we're monitoring the chat box all the time, so if you're interested, do put your details in there. 
and we will uh, we will get in touch with you. Um, and I guess the, the the big question that people have got now is how how can your organisation work with the programme if you want to work with the programme? So I'm going to hand over to my friend and colleague uh, Maeve, who's director of volunteering at Helpforce, who will talk to you about how you can uh, how you can work with us to run a volunteer to career programme. Maeve, over to you. Thanks, Mark. And yeah, uh, Rosie's a very, very uh, hard act to follow. Not quite sure how I got this gig, but anyway, <laughs> here we go. Um, just before, uh, as Mark says, I'm going to tell you a bit about how Help Force will support you in this process and um, for those that are interested. But I just wanted to say a few words um, before before I said that. One is um, many moons ago, uh, probably before quite a lot of people on this call were, were born, actually, um, just before I started on my nursing career, I volunteered in the children's ward in the hospital because I just wasn't sure. I just wasn't sure if this is what I wanted to do. And it just exactly like Rosie describes, watching the nurses, watching the doctors, watching the teamwork, working with the parents, absolutely cemented um, my my decision um, to do nursing. So way before any of this, um, and as I said before, some of you were born actually, um, I actually was that volunteer thinking about a, a career in nursing and, and taking the opportunity to volunteer to to learn a wee bit more about it. So first hand, uh, first hand experience of what some of our uh, volunteers were going through. So I've been involved with the volunteer career program since it started about three years ago, and it's so exciting to be here today and to to um, just I suppose realise the dream that that we had for this program when we started. Um, and it's really fantastic to watch people who started on the journey with this move into healthcare careers and training. The numbers Mark shared earlier are they're even better, I think, than than I'd expected. Personally, there's a few people I'd like to to thank. This has been a huge team effort from everybody in Help Force, but particularly um, two two colleagues I'd like to pull out. One being Max, who's here on the call. Um, Max kind of took my early ramblings around volunteer to career and she turned them into a coherent whole um, and and trust me that that wasn't an easy an easy thing to do um, and spearheaded the early days of the volunteer to career program and um, secondly to Mark Barrett who picked up the baton and has done wonders with it over the last 10 months so so thanks particularly to both of of those colleagues I'd also like to thank the early adopter trusts um, and the clinical leads in those trusts. Without you taking the leap of faith with us um, and helping us to shape and um, go on this journey together, um, it, it, we wouldn't we wouldn't have got to where we are today. So specifically, I'd like to thank Joanne Smith, Dean, Doug, Debbie, Anne, Sarah, Catherine, and Joe. Who, um, who who early doors um, took a punt on this. I'm really glad you did. Um, as Mark said to the funders, uh, Burdett and um, the um, HEE, who, who have helped us um, to keep this program on, on the road through their funding. Um, and finally, and really crucially, to all the volunteers who embarked with us on the journey and are now moving on to careers. Um, it's just their commitment and enthusiasm, really, that's made this possible. So thank you all very much. Um, so now you've 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 um, you've been listening for the best part of forty five minutes about the the program and and kind of the journey we've had with it. And I'm absolutely sure lots of you are thinking, I, I, well, I'd like part of this. I'd like to be involved in this. Um, and just really interested to know a bit more about how do how do we do that. Um, but more importantly, kind of how will Help Force help help you help you, and, and where will we add um, our value and experience to your program? So the first thing is around um, we'll 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 support you to make the case. Um, what what we've what we've experienced in the past is that volunteer services managers and other people within the trust will be really enthusiastic about taking this step. Um, to setting up this program, um, we'll help you to to encourage and work with colleagues within your trust, making a case what it looks like, what it entails, and really importantly, what the benefits are for it. So we will help you through um, dedicated resource 
in working with you at, at a trust level, kind of ho metaphorically holding your hand through the process and um, to make sure that th that we understand what your needs as an organization are um, and how the needs, how the volunteer program can help you realize that, particularly in, in that workforce space. We'll, once we've helped you develop the case and the plan, we'll help you execute it. We'll we'll support you to make sure that you know the the blocks that that come up that we help you to navigate them, um, and and we'll we'll stick with you, um, helping you again working with what how do we support volunteers? How do we get the best of our volunteers? What potential roles might be available, and how how can we work them up into and, and realize them as as volunteer roles that people can undertake. Crucially and really importantly, we'll help you measure the impact. And um, it's been our experience over the last number of years is the the thing that mostly makes people sit up and and listen is being able to demonstrate the difference that this makes. Um, and and we'll come in and with our dedicated team and we'll work with you to help to measure the impact of your program again so that you can share that internally but also that we can start to share the best practice from from the program right across with colleagues up and down the country the i don't think i can um you know being able to sit here today and, and talk about 88 percent of volunteers who are on the program go on to training or careers in healthcare that's the sort of information that's the head turning information that we need to make sure that this program is adopted through organizations and workforce strategies right across the country. So let's work together to enable volunteers to be part of your workforce strategy. If you want to know more, as Mark says, please put your name in the chat and we will be in touch just as soon as we can. Two other things to help you in your decision around that if you want to read more before you take the leap, we have developed um, a guide, which is around setting up uh, volunteer to career program. This is a really detailed um, journey through all the things that you you will need to think about and we will help you to think about if and when you decide to go with a volunteer to career program in your trust. That is available online and the link is now um, on the screen for people to download that and read that at your leisure. Um, one other thing for me before I pass back to Mark is um, Mark referenced earlier that our Back to Health campaign, as part of that, we have developed a Back to Health newsletter. And in that newsletter, we are um, updating people on the different projects that we're working on and the different organisations that we're working with. Um, we would really like the people on this call to share that information with them. So if you'd like to subscribe to our Back to Health newsletter, please tick yes. You have no no option. You'll notice there on <laughs> yes option. So 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 tick the box and we'll make sure to keep in contact with you so you can see the whole um see all of the work that Health Force is doing, but but also the progress we're making against the volunteer to career project also. So thank you all very much. Um, as I said, it's just um, really great, really great to be here today um, and to share this project with all of you. Thank you so much for your interest. And I'm going to pass back to Mark. Thanks, Maeve. Great stuff. Yeah, it, it, as Maeve said, it, if you're interested, you might not, you might feel you're not ready for it now, but just to be kept informed by uh, receiving the newsletter and just keeping in touch with us, very happy very happy to do that and um, we've had uh, a great response um, from the trust we've we've worked with um, and as I say right at the start that would only be possible with funding from Vedette and Health Education England and sincere thanks to our wonderful wonderful funders um, it's not easy when you're setting up a new program to know where it's actually going to go but um, I, th I think we've managed to use the funding that we've been given to try and develop a program that's got traction and scale which is uh, which is always important to us so you have all been putting questions there have been loads of questions in the uh, the chat box so thank you all for doing that and our wonderful head of our help force network sally williams has been frantically going through all the questions to try and group them together so that she can she can run the q a session with the uh, with our panel um, so joining the people that you've already met today, um, our, our speakers today, we've got um, three folks 
who've already been uh, who've already been trailed um, during the uh, during the session. I'm really pleased that I, I mentioned Debbie uh, McEwen, who was uh, who was really the inspiration for this program. Um, and Debbie's going to join the uh, Q and A panel, and she's the um, I've got to read this: the interim nursing midwifery and allied health professionals workforce lead at South Tees um, Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. So very. Big welcome to Debbie. Lots of experience of getting literally hundreds of volunteers into employment. We've got um, Catherine Jowett, who's head of charity and volunteering at, at, at Bradford, um, working with Bob. Um, Catherine's been really engaged with the Help Force uh, volunteering programmes and uh, has really had a successful cohort one. So we've always appreciated Catherine's support and feedback and delighted that she's on the panel. And we've also got the wonderful Joe Scott, um, from Camden and Islington, who's the who who I think you you're in a new role now, Joe, and I'm hoping that I've got your new job title right, which is Patient and Care Experience and Engagement Lead for Camden and Islington NHS Foundation Trust. So, congratulations on the new role. Great to have you here as well, sharing your experience. Um, and as as I say, you were working alongside uh, Rosie, and we've also got our very own Mark Barrett, who's the program manager for uh, Volunteer to Career. So delighted to have Mark as well. Um, so I am now going to shut up and hand over to Sally, who is going to chair the uh, questions and answers session, which is possibly the most difficult job of the whole morning, <laughs> Sally. So uh, good luck with that. And I'll, uh, no pressure. I'll, I'll leave Thanks. you to it. Thanks, Mark. Um, firstly, thank you all for your questions. There's some really great ones and I'm going to do my best to direct them to the person who's best placed to, to answer them. We won't go around the whole panel, but we'll go to the person who is most likely to be able to give a, um, an answer straight away. So I hope that sounds OK. Um, the first question was uh, was quite an easy one, actually. Lindsay asked if um, the programme is available in Wales. The short answer to that is is yes. So um, Lindsay, please do put your details in the chat box if you'd like someone to get in touch with you. Um, Abby has asked um, about the capacity to facilitate the clinical lead role. Um, it, it, she feels it may present staffing challenges and there's been a couple of people asking questions on a similar theme. I wonder if we can go to Debbie um, about that question because you've got the longest track record so far. Um, could you could you help Abby with her query, Debbie? I can. Abby, are you on the call? Just will you just tell me again, Sally, the query? Yeah. So um, Abby's asked about capacity. How how you organise the capacity to facilitate the clinical lead role? How does that work in practice? Um, does it present staffing challenges for the team? Um, I mean, I think. It's probably I'm in an easier position um, facilitating this because of the kind of clinical impact of, of my role um, and having that connectivity with the clinical staff in within the departments where the volunteers are going to be. Is that what you're asking? How we manage the, the volunteer flow in the clinical areas with the capacity um, of the clinical I, staff? I, I think so. And, and also, how do you organise the, the staffing? to accommodate that clinical lead role and that shift across to to managing the volunteer side of the operation. So at South Tees, the kind of general day to day management is completed by our volunteer coordinators. So they will do the allocations and the staff know in advance who's coming. So because the induction, the orientation, all of the, the role is already covered by the um, the volunteer coordinator when they're actually going into the wards and departments, the hard work is done in effect um, because they've got the little flashcards of what they need to be doing, the different types of roles they can do, how they can um, support the staff and the patients in the department. If I think about um, the project that we had with Help Force in ED with our wellbeing volunteers, we did have a link nurse in that department who the volunteers could go to and who the volunteer coordinator linked with directly. So if there were any issues whilst in the department, they kind of took the lead for that. And in their absence, they had other delegated staff members. I'm not sure I'm answering the question. Oh, this, correctly. No, that's great. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I'm also going to ask Catherine, would you be able to give a, uh, your perspective on that question? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. It is a challenge. Our um, clinical lead was actually a health visitor um, and 
that negotiation of releasing her clinical time um, from a from a service area that is massively understaffed and under significant challenges. Um, you know, we had to get, you know, her managers and, and actually that sign off from their side. Um, she actually only worked three days a week, so she did two days a week on volunteer to career and she kept, kept clinical work one day a week. Um, it was a challenge, but actually the value and what she gave back. Um, so through the project that we ran, we were able to reopen some baby clinics that had been closed due to COVID and actually staff were really struggling to have the capacity to do that but through this program and her time actually being able to do that and bring volunteers in meant that actually the time that she was taken away from kind of clinical work actually was put back in in another way so it is about kind of realizing the impact and the benefit um of you know yes clinical time is incredibly valuable but the funding is there to backfill that so you know it is that kind of the funding is there to backfill as long as you can get the staff to backfill which is part of the challenge um so yeah it, it is really difficult and actually uh the second time she's now doing a second project and actually the, the team actually went we can't we can't second her they'd closed down any op common opportunities so she actually handed a notice in as a health visitor and is working fully on volunteer to career now so it's it's challenging it is challenging and it is about the conversations and understanding actually what that role gives back and because she was delivering it in her area they could see the benefit and the value thanks catherine um i think this is a really important question um i just want to oh mark mark b would mm -hmm. you like to come in there Thanks, Sally. You saw my hand. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Debbie and Catherine are absolutely right in what they said. And I was, I was just going to add to that. I think if we go back a step, it, 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 it's about making the case. And I think the successful programmes that we're supporting are the ones that have looked, worked collaboratively across the healthcare organisation in understanding where the demands are on those clinical departments. It's also been mindful of what the workforce needs are and have then created a volunteering role that has looked, you know, um, that has started to address both of those, both of those areas. At that point, and you've gone, got that sponsorship, then we've gone out to advert, uh, advertise for a clinical role. And on average, it's about two days a week um, to run a volunteering career programme that sort of generally supports around 20 volunteers through a 12 month, a 12 month cycle. And interestingly enough, um, we haven't necessarily had an issue in attracting clinical leads to fill those positions. I think there's been a lot of clinicians that have actually seen it as quite an exciting opportunity to broaden their skill set, um, undergo further training, you know, in terms of how to deliver a program, um, a project, and and have come on and have come on board. Generally, they've been anywhere between band five, band seven. Um, I'm probably answering lots of questions here because there was another question there in terms of well, what types of Clinical reads, clinical roles are have people have applied for, and they've come from nursing, um, healthcare assistants. There's there's a, there's been a whole range of of, of, of roles um, that that that, that uh, clinical leads have come from to step forward and, and and run the program. But again, I think it comes back, you know, to that see, gaining that senior buy-in, making the business case, understanding the governance, the steering group, and supporting that process all the way through that has proven to be you know, successful for cohort one, certainly, and the current 15 programmes that are running. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, I think we should move on to another question. Um, Jean has asked how how people go about sifting volunteers. How do you go about selecting the best people for the roles and to meet the needs and the aspirations of the organisation? Um, I wonder if that's something you could address, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, I mean, in our trust, we we're, were a mental health trust, and and I'm, I guess, not all organisations recruit volunteers in the same way. So we do interview all our volunteers and kind of try and find the best fit of a role for them. Um, we did approach the V2C slightly different to some of the other trusts in the programme. Um, and kind of had a role that we already had up and running, which is our restraint debrief role, and 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 saw the link um, potential for that for for volunteers that might be interested in going into peer coaches roles like um, like Rosie um, did. 
Um, actually, when we looked at the things that those volunteers were interested in, they were really looked at, you know, much wider um, options of careers than that. Obviously, they're all individuals and looking at different things. But um, so so we've had a, a combination of both volunteers that were already volunteering with us that, that came into the, the, the volunteer to career programme and then new ones that come up. But, you know, so some of our key things were about kind of lived experience and, and, and being able to use that in a kind of positive way to support others. So, yeah, really kind of honing on those qualities, I suppose, of caring um, before looking at specific skills for volunteers to bring them in. I hope that helps. Fantastic. Thank you, Jo. Um, Debbie has got a hand up. Do you want to come in there, Debbie? Yeah, ours is actually the um, opposite to what Jules described and we don't interview. Um, we have quite an extensive list of volunteering opportunities that are available um, and we do an online application. So actually, most of our contact is done online or on the telephone until they come in for their induction. Now, so far, whether it's good luck or good choices, I'm not too sure. We've not we've managed to not appoint any serial killers as um, volunteers. We haven't had any major hiccups. Um, so we're quite happy to continue with that approach. When we looked at the project we did with Help Force, we definitely were more selective with that in terms of promoting it as an opportunity for people who either had lived experience um, or who had an interest particularly around mental health. Um, and we also targeted our psychology students. We have two modules at Teesside Uni. So we were able to kind of really um, promote it within that particular group. But again, the, the interview process, we did do that for a period of time, but it was just so time intensive. We weren't able to based on the, the sheer volume of people that were applying. And I, I'm definitely of the mindset of if it's not broke, don't fix it. However, when we do get our first serial killer, I'll probably rethink and we'll go back to interviewing again. Thanks, Debbie. Um, Catherine, can I come to you just for, for completeness to see how how you do things? Uh, yeah, well, we do a combination. So our process starts online with an application form. But yeah, we do interview all of our um, potential volunteers and that volunteer that interview is done by the service that will be receiving them. So it's not done by us as the volunteer service. It is actually done by the service so that actually that they can make sure that they're the right fit both ways, that actually it's the right fit for the volunteer and the right fit for the service. Um, so, yeah, we do kind of do a bit of a kind of blended process of some of it's online. A lot of the training happens online, but we do make sure that we kind of have that conversation um, with volunteers. Um, and, and yeah, I think you know, you know the, the volunteer to career bit has changed the conversation a little bit just to really understand where they're coming from and their aspirations and their reason why they want to kind of go into that volunteer to career role and pursue that. Fantastic. Thank you all for your answers. Um, jo has asked, um, Maeve, I think this is one for you, whether we have considered linking up with St John Ambulance. Um, Hi, Maeve. Yeah, hi. Yes, yes, we have, and we've had a um, we've had a couple of conversations um, with St John's Ambulance um, and their cadet program. So we haven't done anything formally, but we we absolutely are in conversation with them. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Jill has asked, um, and I think this is probably one for Catherine. How have you implemented? How have you? Sorry. How have you implemented service user involvement um, in your volunteer recruitment strategy? Um, for example, long term unemployed and people from disadvantaged um, communities. Um, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, more broadly, our volunteer recruitment, this is kind of an area of focus for us. Um, we haven't per se targeted volunteer to career in any certain ways although the first recruitment which was around baby clinics our clinical lead was very much like i would love to you know recruit mums who've used the service and maybe aren't looking or aren't kind of thinking about that career kind of stuff 
Um, but our volunteer recruitment generally, we're always kind of thinking about actually how do we engage people who live in Bradford and maybe don't normally get these kind of opportunities, aren't necessarily looking. We've got an incredibly diverse community. Um, we use a range of kind of communication methods out into the community, but also through our in, our in services. So we work very closely with our involvement team. We've got a great employment service. Kind of our community mental health team so we we very much promote volunteer roles internally through those teams so that actually they're identifying people uh, we have quite a strong kind of recovery um element to our to our volunteering program as well and actually we have people who come through that kind of recovery element but then move on to thinking about volunteer to career so i think it's 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 broadly an area that i think always needs work you know we've, we're never going to have completely kind of gone yes great all of our volunteer recruitment is completely inclusive and we can always do more but I think you know we've got a real sense um, not just through volunteering but as a trust and as an organisation as a sector that we want to grow our own in Bradford we want to engage people in Bradford and give them opportunities and keep them in Bradford and keep them within our health, health and social care and, and you know employing our own so I think it's, you know, it's one of those th aspirational things that there's always more work to do, but we just try and engage in as many different ways as we can um, to make sure that we are giving people opportunities. And, and I say, you know, the volunteer to career bit is still very new for us. And I think that is just going to grow. Fantastic. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Mark, got your hand up. Hi. Oh, thanks, Sally. I was just going to expand to that a little bit more because it, it, it is a really exciting space and, and we are seeing a bit of a, a, a shift in the in, in, in the demographics of volunteering where VTC organisations are, are, are actually proactively engaging more so within the community to build referral partnerships um, for specific um, demographics of volunteers for the VTC programme. If we talk about Somerset, um, who are delivering a, a, a volunteer to career programme at an ICS level, um, creating the VTC programme at system level um, in, and have chosen particular areas of deprivation to, to, to run the programme um, at place level, you know, are doing very well through those partnerships in attracting the specific type of volunteering demographic they wanted to for the neighbourhood respondable volunteering uh, volunteers that, that, that they're operating. And I think that we're talking to a lot of organisations that as well that have aspirations around running a special educational needs um, volunteering to career type programme. Um, so yeah, it's it's all emerging, um, but there's a there's the opportunity there to develop these specific types of of of, of volunteering to career programs. Quite an exciting space, and of course, all of this you know supports with regards to health inequalities, and and it helps healthcare organisations by taking on and attracting those volunteers to represent you know the local demographic um, uh, represented through their patients. Um, in, in terms of the support um, from, from, from volunteers from the local community. Thanks, Mark. I'm going to go to Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Uh, just quickly, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about Prospect, which is a pro programme we've worked really closely with through the Department of Work and Pensions. So they do have employability schemes. And you could argue, actually, is it volunteering if they are still in receipt of the benefits? But actually, it is in terms of the outcomes because they're providing exactly the same service to patients as volunteers that come through in the traditional route. But obviously, that's focusing on people who live in the geographical area um, and people who are actively looking um, for employment within the care sector, whether that's within an acute hospital trust or in the community. So it will be worth reaching out to your local um Job Centre Plus, Department of Work and Pensions, to see what programmes they do have available for you to be able to promote your volunteering services too. Fantastic. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I think I'm going to move on to a topic that's come up a few times, and it's around um, opportunities to run the programme in social care or across health and social care settings. Um, can we go to Maeve to start with? Hi, Maeve. Yeah, I, totally. I mean, there, there, there is really no, no boundaries um, around where you can set the programme up. I actually saw another question in the chat around um, 
can we can we do this in a hospice setting? I mean, the principles are 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 there, and um, they can be. I think the important thing is that um, the project reflects where the organisation is and what the organisation's um, um, direction of travel and fitting in the, this volunteer to grow career program as part of that strategy. So there really is no no limits or or no boundaries around the the types of um, settings that we can run the program and we'd be happy to to talk to people individually about those. Thanks Maeve. Catherine, hi. Hi oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know whether you wanted me to just pick up the there was a question about ICS as well and, and working across the ICS with this. Um, we haven't quite gone to ICS as yet, although we've had a lot of conversations. There are other trusts in our ICS that are doing this and we, we've had a lot of positive conversations promoting this, but we are working at place. So we are now delivering a second volunteer to career project within our AHP services and it was our AHP lead who recognised there was an opportunity to work at place so with our two acute hospital colleagues. Um, so we're now delivering or first recruitments are happening, but we've developed volunteer roles uh, with Airedale Hospital and BRI Hospital and with ourselves. And we'll be recruiting volunteers to those roles um, with the idea being that volunteers can, can move around and get different experiences of different types of AHP roles um, and actually a really interesting kind of challenge we've had to get over, but actually has really opened up an exciting conversation about is actually we've done the recruitment of those volunteers, but actually we've putting agreements in place that we can then deploy volunteers into those two acute hospitals without the volunteers having to repeat all the volunteer recruitment processes. So that's a fantastic kind of unlocking of a door that actually could have real kind of development opportunities for the future about how we work more closely together. And actually this programme has been that real opportunity to kind of have those conversations. So yeah, really excited to be kind of doing this at place with the AHP, AHP colleagues and giving volunteers kind of a, a, a greater opportunity to get that experience in different environments and different roles. Um, so, yeah, really, really early days, but um, it, it's completely doable to kind of move people around the system, if you like. Brilliant. Thanks, Catherine. Um, can I just um, mention if anyone has a question, if you could use the chat box, please. So we're taking um, hands up from people on the panel, but if you're in the audience, um, it would be great if you could use the chat box for your questions and we will get through as many as we can by the end of the session. Thank you. Um, so we have um, quite a, a short question from Jean about the length of time it takes or it could take from becoming a volunteer to progressing to an employed role. Is is there a kind of yardstick or is it um, as long as a piece of string? I wonder, um, perhaps Joe, in your capacity as, uh, as um, Rosie's volunteer manager, would you be able to help us with that one? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really individual um, for people. We've had people go on to careers with us pre the volunteer to career program and project if you like um, that definitely took a lot longer than it has done for volunteers that have been involved in the v2c so i think having that structure and support for people has really helped people be able to progress quicker to where they want to go i mean as a mental health trust though we have a lot of volunteers that are maybe more focused on on the recovery and catherine talked about a similar thing in her trust now but that's you know not to say that that down the line the b2c um kind of program will really help them but it's like that's not their priority now so i think you know it's really dependent on those individuals and, and just making sure that the reasons they're there you're working towards and, and their aspirations around recovery as well as their aspirations into um, a career and I think it really helps just generally for everyone build people's confidence around you know the skills and qualities and things that they can actually bring to the table that they maybe don't recognize in themselves so so yeah not a not a, a one size fits all in terms of time but i definitely think the v2c program has speeded that up for for people that that you know it might have taken longer before lovely thanks joe um debbie i think you put your hand up did you want to say something about that uh, i did just because it is Joe said it is so varied and we, at South Tees we've literally had people that have 
environment, particularly towards the end of the pandemic. Um, and you're talking days of two people in particular in critical care um, because the timing was such that vacancies had gone out and they were in the right place at the right time. Um, so they were just able to apply for them straight away. But for particularly around the volunteer to create projects that, that we had in ED, from the very first point of entry into the organisation, people were actively looking um, for posts within that area or other departments around about. And that was part of our role to help them with that, to look at job searches, um, to prepare them for interview. And often that happened much more quickly than what the volunteer expected it was going to. But again, coming out of the pandemic, there were vacancies that needed to be filled and um, throughout the pandemic. We, you know, we've seen, I think, off the top of my head, I think we had something like 92 volunteers um, were employed throughout the course of the pandemic, um, not just through the volunteer to career programme in ED, but throughout the organisation. So it, it really is dependent on what opportunities are available at that time and actually how proactive the volunteers are as well. You're on mute, Sally. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> I was just going to ask Max if she'd like to come in there. I think you've got your hand up, Max. Just just to add to, to that bit, one of the, the the most fantastic of systemic changes we've seen as a result of this programme has been HR um, as a result, sort of allowing access to um, to the intranet and those internal vacancies directly to volunteers where they, that hasn't been possible before. So in terms of the journey and the time it takes, that inclusivity has been been addressed by that sort of that change in behaviour and and the HR and, and the organisation recognising the value of volunteers and, and bringing those two things together. Thanks, Max. Really helpful. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Ruth um, who's asking about entry requirements um, for the programme and also does it give opportunities for accredited learning for volunteers to help them on their employment journey? Um, Mark B, would you like to start with that one? Um, yeah, sure, Sally. I mean, I I, I don't think that, that there are or have been any entry requirements really, other other than that when the, the role has been advertised, you know, the participating organisations have followed the current processes and policies in place in terms of recruiting and, and inducting and onboarding. I think that's the wonderful thing around the VTC programme. It's almost as though it's like an extended interview for some volunteers to spend time and understand the, the culture of the organisation, both have a look at each other as well as spend that valuable time with clinical leads, you know, and understanding in terms of what direction they want to go and listening to, to Rosie's story and so many other volunteers on the VTC programme, you know, result in that increased interest, confidence um, and, and ambition. So other than the volunteer or the applicant expressing an interest in that particular type of volunteering role, um, everything else is, 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 is by the book. What was the second part of the question, Sally? Um, it was to do with um, opportunities for accredited learning as part of the programme so that um, volunteers have something to help them with their employment pathway. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, mm -hmm. and I think this has been the longer we deliver, de deliver the VTC programme, the, the more this is um, the more this is developing. And it's, it's just great to have 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 Kirsty here from Health Education England uh, as, as well, talking around the connectivity of that. So a couple of examples, um, many of the participating organisations, you know, have gone down the national volunteering certificate route. Um, asking volunteers to, uh, to 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 volunteer for about 60 hours i think it is um and um and and have the opportunity of securing that certificate at, at, at the end of it um there's been a number of again number of organizations through the community partnership work that have brought in pre-employability providers um who have come in working in groups providing interviewing confidence confidence building 
um, as part of the career path, as a component of the career pathway. So third party support with regards to that, resulting in further certificates um, and, and linking to the talent for care from Health Education England. You know, we're in discussions around how can the VTC program weave into their widening access and participation agenda um, and other programs, whether it be um, the um, again national unit volunteering, but but also uh, volunteers moving through onto apprenticeships um, and using the VTC program as a stepping stone to move on to apprenticeships and so forth. Um, and we're looking on a local level or, or in relation to the specific type of volunteering role, what other courses and 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 uh, can, can volunteers go on whilst they're volunteering? So. Yes, is the answer to that question. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. I think we've <laughs> probably got time for perhaps one more question. Um, Emma has asked about examples of clinical lead job roles. Um, what kind of people could could be a clinical lead in the volunteer to career program? So, um, Debbie, do you want to start? I think, Thank you. Um, I'm not nurse bias um, and I'm not going to say just nursing because actually any um, registered healthcare professionals could take the lead on um, on, on the clinical lead role. So the, the clinical lead we had was actually a mental health nurse um, who that in an acute trust was not normal practice for us, I guess, because we didn't have it. Um, so there were lots of differences in her approach um, and what my approach would have been as a registered general nurse, but actually it really complemented um, how we could deliver the programme because of her level of expertise. But I guess the, the successes that we've experienced have, abs have absolutely been that colleague to colleague support um, and that kind of, can you do me a favour? approach um, now whether that's been with a nurse an OT a physio when you're going at it from that kind of level with registered healthcare professional to registered healthcare professional it just seems to work um, more effectively so I would build it into whatever the, the clinical role is anyway so for for me as a clinical lead and for Megan who was a clinical lead it was part of our day-to-day -day role so using kind of volunteers as part of the workforce strategy that's how we could evidence it it was something that needed to be part of our day-to-day -day role fabulous thanks debbie um catherine could you give us some i know you've already touched on your uh, main volunteer um clinical lead role but do you have any other examples you could share yeah, I mean, when we actually first rec recruited our clinical lead, we actually put it out to the whole organisation. So we created the role and basically said we're looking for a passionate clinical lead in a clinical area where there are staffing challenges, which let's face it, is everywhere, and that we could see the opportunity for good volunteer roles. We had three clinical members of staff from different roles in the organisation apply and we went with Joe, who's a health visitor, because we could see the opportunities within kind of health visiting. So, yeah, I mean, that the advantage of her delivering in the area that she was familiar with made a huge difference, that initial project. But actually, she's now moved on and is actually delivering the project in AHP. So it's actually not her now area of specialism. She's closely linked with the AHP lead. So she's the AHP lead is bringing all the contacts and all the rest of it, connecting her in with everybody. But she's still going in as that band seven health visitor clinician. Um, but yeah, in an area she's not familiar with, she's going into hospital, she's used to going into people's homes. So it, for her, actually, it's also now a massive learning curve of having to do that and in different environment. But yeah, she she kind of still has that clinical background and yeah, that kind of credibility and understanding around those that clinical work. So um, yeah, I, I think you you know it can come it can come from anywhere. Your clinical lead can come from anywhere. I think it's finding the right opportunity, the right person. Um, you know, our clinical lead is phenomenal and so so passionate about this agenda that she just made it work despite you know challenges and barriers across along the way. But she was the right person, and I think that's just really important. Find that right clinical re lead who really gets in, is passionate about it. Fantastic, thanks, Catherine. 
I think we're going to have to wrap up. Um, I just want to thank everybody for your questions. If there's any that we haven't managed to get to, um, apologies, but we will gather them all up and we will respond as best we can to you after after today. Um, thank you also for those who have um, expressed an interest and put your details in, in the chat box. Um, Mark, just to Mark B, just to finish with, Sarah has asked about role descriptions for clinical lead roles. If there's a way we can gather some up to share as part of the, the package that we share after this, I think that might be useful for people. It's just something for us to think about. Um, yep. So thank you, Mark. I'm going to hand back to Mark Cleaver now. Thank you, Sally. Great job. Great job. Fiona Bruce needs to look over her shoulder. Um, a excellent job at marshalling all those uh, marshalling all those questions and, and sharing with them. I I think what it what it highlighted to me was the level of interest in the program is just phenomenal, which is great. But also the collective insights that everybody's got, and the uh, the fact that whilst it's a national program, there's lots of local nuance and lo lots of local variation, and the power of a network bringing folks like you with such great experience together to learn from each other is a really important part of the program. Um, and we're, you know, part of that program is to is to continue using all of your insights and sharing them as we go forward. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending. We've had massive attendance today and really appreciated that. But in particular, I want to thank our speakers. So great um, insights from Bob, from Kirsty, from Health Education England, and of course from Rosie and from Maeve, and to our expert um, panelists who did such a great job in answering the questions. So. Debbie and Joe and Catherine and Mark and others who contributed as well. And we've got a final poll just to see if you would now consider volunteer to career as part of your workforce solution. So we can see the before and after that would be really helpful. Um, I want to thank the wonderful Health Force team for not just developing the programme and making the programme real, but for actually putting on this event as well. So great job team, um, really good job, really impressed with that. And I think my final my final word is to is about Rosie. I think Rosie, if you want to have the spend your afternoon on a high, read some of the comments in the chat box, um, and and just see what people are saying. Absolutely fabulous. And you know we know the NHS is facing tremendous staffing pressures, but my goodness, if they're recruiting volunteers like you into the workforce, then I think we can all look forward with a great deal of optimism. So thank you all so much for your contributions today and for coming along to the event. We really appreciate your support. Thanks for all the interest you've shown in the in the chat box. And we will uh, we will keep in touch with you and let's really make get this program to get some traction as we go forward. Thanks everyone and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye now.